Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this seminar and uh, book launch. So, uh, so the seminar is on the uh, energy, climate finance and policy analysis. And we are going to launch our new handbook uh, that edited by Professor Dayong Zhang and myself so thank you for joining so today we are going to have uh, three presentations uh, by professor hyun suk that joined us here uh, at toka university uh, professor uh, shunpeng shi and uh, professor dayong zhang and then we will have a q a and after that, we are going to introduce and launch our new uh, handbook. So before that, uh, the agenda is available. In, the QR code of it is over there that you can scan and uh, see the QR code and it already shared with you before. In addition to that, let me use this uh, opportunity to introduce the uh, program that ISETS, International Society for Energy Transition Studies, launched the first youth voice competition for energy transition. And this is in collaboration with United Nations, ESCAP. And you can see the QR code of it over there and scan it. It will direct you to the website. And it is a competition for youth between 18 years on, uh, on and 25 years. You can join this competition and submit your applications. And then the selection committee will uh, review, will check, and the accepted applicants will be invited to present, whether online or at the United Nations ESCAP in Bangkok at um, uh, inaugural conference of ISETS to be organized uh, on October 16 and 17. So more information is available in that website that you can scan the QR code of it and see it then apply it. Okay, so let me uh, invite our first distinguished speaker, Professor uh, Hyun Suk, who is a professor and dean of the Graduate School of Environmental Finance of Yonsei University of Korea. Uh, he came to Japan for this uh, event, and we are very happy to see him uh, here at our university. His uh, presentation is on potential of green bonds for funding sustainability. Professor Hyun Suk, please. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for your kind uh, invitation and introduction. Uh, today I'm going to uh, make a presentation on a potential of a green bonds for uh, financing sustainability. Actually, it is not uh, directly related to energy policy, but it's about financing a renewable energy project. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain uh, the definition of uh, green bonds. So what is green bonds? Actually, uh, uh, it, it takes us uh, some time to explain everything about green bonds, but uh, simply put, uh, green bonds are financial instruments that uh, raise capital for environmentally beneficial uh, project. And these bonds uh, combine financial risk and the, the environmental risk into one uh, single uh, product, which are uh, different from the conventional or ordinary uh, bonds. And recently, they have becoming uh, increasingly popular uh, as uh, the creative approach to uh, mitigating the uh, adverse effects, negative effect of a human and economic activities of climate change. Uh, that, that's why many uh, financial institutions or companies, they are issuing 
uh, green bonds. However, uh, it, issuing green bonds incur a higher uh, transaction cost because uh, the, uh, I'm going to explain later about the, the structure of uh, the green bonds issuance. The more uh, complex the procedure for uh, disclosing information because uh, uh, different from the conventional bonds, uh, when company issue green bonds, they have to disclose, provide more detailed information about environmental impact or the environmental related informations that uh, uh, cause uh, more uh, transaction costs to, to uh, companies. So if you look at uh, this graph, uh, uh, the blue line shows uh, the green finance, including green bonds. The people have a more uh, increasing uh, interest in uh, green bonds and uh, green finance. While on the other hand, uh, the concern about greenwashing uh, also increasing. So simply put, uh, greenwashing can occur when the issuers company make uh, inaccurate or exaggerated claims about the environmental benefits of the project being financed by the, the green bonds, uh, because uh, the greenwashing can have uh, significant uh, price implications uh, in green bonds market and the, the financial markets are increasingly sensitive to the risk associated with it because uh, some companies, they just to uh, use the green bond for their green marketing without any effort to improve the, the, the environmental uh, 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 impact. So when company issue green bonds, the, they can enjoy kind of a green bond premium we call greenium because uh, the same company, they can issue both ordinary bonds and the green bonds. But if you compare the interest rate of a green bond and the ordinary bonds, the, the, the interest rate of a green bond is much lower than that of uh, the ordinary bonds. So they can enjoy kind of a premium, green bond premium. So some companies, they don't make any effort to improve the environment, but they issue green bonds and they just use uh, green marketing. So we, we call the kind of activities is uh, the greenwashing. So uh, according to some uh, studies, they already point out uh, the kind of uh, the greenwashing problems or uh, environmental integrity of the green bonds. So uh, usually when company issue green bonds, they uh, have to follow the voluntary rule uh, by the ICMA, International Capital Market Association, they uh, published the, the kind of guideline, green bond uh, principle, and also another international organization, uh, Climate Bond Initiative, they also uh, made uh, some guideline, so-called uh, the Climate Bond Standard, but it, it is not mandatory, just to, uh, apparently the company followed that uh, guideline and uh, they try to meet their uh, kind of requirement of uh, uh, green bonds. Another challenge is uh, we don't have any conventionally uh, accepted uh, define of uh, green bonds. Also, the, what, what is the, the uh, green? Now, some countries, they already uh, adopted uh, the uh, green uh, taxonomy, the green uh, classification. The Korean government also uh, adopted the uh, uh, Korean the, uh, taxonomies, which define uh, what is green, what is uh, green uh, industries, and what is uh, green uh, sectors. But if you compare those uh, uh, taxonomies, it is very uh, different from country to country. And another uh, challenge is that the uh, pricing mechanism, as I already explained, the greenium, the same company, they have the same financial risk and they have the same uh, credit ratings, but if you compare the interest rate of uh, green bonds and the, the ordinary bond, it's uh, very uh, different. So many uh, scholars and uh, economists, they try to explore why 
those uh, pricing uh, difference uh, is taking place. So uh, I, I tried to uh, explore why those uh, uh, price difference are uh, 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 taking place in uh, green bond market. So usually uh, there are many uh, papers to explain uh, the green ions and but I, I just to focus on the, the, the asymmetric information. So I, I try to uh, classify uh, the issuers, companies, green bond issuers into two categories, the frequent issuers and the infrequent issuers, because uh, frequent issuers, they are trying to tempt market very frequently and they uh, provide more information than the, the infrequent issuers. So I try to measure the, the price difference between uh, frequent issuers and the infrequent issuers. So frequent issuers, who can provide more information to investors and to the market, they can save eight basis points. So they can uh, save monies by providing more information because uh, the investors, they can assess the true greenness of uh, green bonds uh, based on the, the information uh, provided by the uh, issuers. So I, I just summarize the policy implications. So uh, yeah, currently, as I explained, that the green bond uh, information disclosure is not mandatory. In, in Korea also, that the uh, green bond disclosure is not mandatory. So and also there is no standard for all the the the, the, uh, the regulation for uh, green bonds. So that the company they voluntarily disclose any information uh, to the market. So that's uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, the limitation and the challenges to further develop the uh, uh, green bond market. So yeah, let, let me introduce uh, the uh, Korean uh, green bond market and the ESG disclosure for your uh, understanding uh, briefly. So uh, as I explained that the, Green bond issuance uh, process is uh, slightly different from the, the, that of uh, uh, the ordinary bonds. So if, if you look at the, the, the red highlight, the issuers, the companies, I, I'm sorry that it is a little difficult for you to read that some uh, characters, uh, it's a, uh, a little you know, blur. Uh, the issuers, the companies, they must submit external review report because uh, before or after uh, green bond issuance, the external reviewers are re reviewing their, uh, the, the green bond process because uh, uh, the GBPO, the, the climate bond standard, they have uh, some you know, rules, the voluntary rules. The, the major rule, the, the important rule is that the, the process of uh, use of process is uh, limited to only environmentally friendly project only. So when they issue green bonds, they must use their money for uh, environmental friendly project only. So they have to disclose uh, information on the use of proceeds. And also they uh, must disclose uh, the environmental impact. So external reviewers assess uh, those uh, requirements. That's why it, incur additional uh, transaction cost when the company issue uh, green bonds. So the issuing companies, they must uh, report to the Korean exchange uh, website. So if you access uh, the, the Korean exchange KRX website, you can download all uh, relevant information on uh, green bonds. So especially, So, yeah, yeah. this one. Mm -hmm. 
we can now do. Ah, okay, okay. So you, you can uh, download uh, the external reviewer report. It provides uh, uh, some yeah, basic information about issuer's name, the issuing amount, and the credit rating, and also use of proceeds and other environmental impact uh, assessment. But it, it, if you check the, the uh, report, some report to just the two pages, no useful information, and some uh, report. The, the number of pages are uh, more than uh, 60 pages or uh, 70 pages include uh, many, including many uh, useful information about uh, green bonds, including uh, use of proceeds and the environment impact. Because uh, the external uh, reviewing is not uh, mandatory in uh, even in Korea. So they just uh, uh, disclose what they want to show. So yeah, focusing on uh, these uh, uh, issues, I, I collected uh, some uh, data, bond market data and uh, ESG rating data. Then I, I did some uh, empirical uh, test. So it, 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 if you look at the, the co coefficient of uh, uh, green bond dummies, if you issue uh, green bonds in, in Korea, you can enjoy a green yield because uh, the, the coefficient of uh, uh, green bond dummy is um, uh, negative. So you can uh, uh, lower the, the interest of uh, green bonds. So when, when you uh, utilize a, a green bond framework, so we can uh, find the existence of a uh, uh, greenium in Korea. Uh, as I explained previously that uh, Issuers, the companies, if they provide more information about uh, environmental impact or you know, use of proceeds and other uh, ESG related information. So if you look at the, the coefficient of uh, interaction term, the green bonds and the ESG ratings, you can uh, further lower the interest rate of uh, green bonds uh, because uh, it, it, it mitigates uh, the asymmetric information problems between uh, issuers and the investors. And also, I can say I can say the same thing about uh, e ratings, environmental ratings. So, and also, I I also use uh, the proxy variable for the, the quality of uh, external uh, reviews. So I use uh, the, the the quality uh, variables, uh, the which is measured as uh, the number of pages, as I uh, told you. So if you look at the, the empirical result, uh, the, this equation has uh, the inverted U-shape. So uh, I calculated the threshold up to 22 or 23 pages. It, it doesn't affect uh, the greeniums. Uh, conversely, it, it, it increased the interest rate because uh, investors, they think their, those information is not enough. But after uh, 23 uh, pages, it can further lower the, the interest rate of uh, green bonds. So if uh, the companies or the issuers, if they uh, provide more information, enough information to investors or market uh, participants, it, it, it can lower the, the, the interest rate of a green bond and then you can enjoy the, the green yields, so-called uh, green yields. So, I can say I can say that from uh, this empirical uh, findings. So let, let me uh, summarize my uh, uh, presentations. Uh, uh, the Korean uh, primary market uh, shows us uh, some uh, existence of a greenium. As I told you, the dummy variable for green bonds is a negative. So company when company utilize uh, green bonds, uh, they can save. Uh, the, the funding cost, uh, approximately uh, eight basis point. And the disclosure of information such as uh, the environmental impact or ESD performance, the, any uh, effort to, to improve uh, the environment uh, can help uh, mitigate uh, asymmetric information problem and lead to uh, even the lower interest rate of uh, sustainable finance. So green bond can be utilized for 
uh, financing uh, sustainability or the renewable energy project. Uh, but yeah, under the currently uh, current regulatory framework, the external review or the green bond disclosure is not mandatory, it's a uh, voluntary. So uh, the companies, issuers, they can uh, just to show what they want to show. Some you know, a company use the green bonds for their uh, green marketings without any uh, effort to improve the, the environment. So in order to address uh, those uh, problems at uh, the Korean the Ministry of Environment, they uh, strengthen regulations for the external uh, reviewers. Uh, so uh, the, the conclusion is that uh, the stronger uh, information disclosure or regulation uh, can help uh, uh, mitigate uh, information asymmetry uh, problems in um, the green bond market, and it can uh, prevent uh, greenwashing uh, problems. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Hyun Suk, for the interesting presentation. Yes, actually, the green bonds are becoming more attractive. However, it is very important to uh, consider these points that you have mentioned in order to avoid green washing. Okay, so uh, next presentation is by Professor uh, Rock Shi, who is a professor at the University of Technology of Sydney, Australia, and he's the president of ISETS, Professor. Rock, thank you for joining this conference and we are waiting for your presentation on energy transition and sustainable development in 2030. Uh, thanks, uh, Fahad, for the invitation. It's good to see the book is out. It's a big project and uh, congratulations for you and Dayong for the uh, work and, and also uh, thanks for the partnership. Uh, I think we put it, I said there. Um, for my 10 minute presentation, I will probably just uh, briefly mention one idea which I'm currently think about. Actually, we haven't done much work. It's um, about the energy transition and the sustainable development. I think we're probably all aware, and uh, now the weather uh, is extremely uh, in many parts of the world, exactly probably today. Uh, I think Dayo just mentioned it was very hot, but uh, the next province is to him today is a lot of rain. And Sankita mentioned in India also a lot of rain. And there was some report actually coming out uh, say that the two days ago, it was the hottest state in the history. Um, the global average temperature is 17 degree. And when you see the, all these figure uh, here recorded the temperature now is uh, uh, it's at the highest uh, level. And people are globally aware that climate change is real and realistic, and we have to do something. Um, but uh, very unfortunately, uh, and it's the even last year, it was already very hot. Uh, the actions actually from the global community is considered still a lot uh, sufficient, that the world in uh, from the Secretary General of the UN and about the uh, human actually societies on the highway to climate here. So uh, apparently we all know we are faced a kind of climate crisis. But on the other hand, we face another crisis or not, somehow a crisis uh, actually is the economic growth. This is the, one of the World Bank. Mm -hmm report about the, the future economic growth. Apparently, if you look at, uh, compare with uh, uh, 20 years ago, the economic growth actually 50% below, actually almost half, uh, probably 60% for the future. So we are facing the challenge of the both economic growth. I think for people from uh, Japan and China, probably relatively okay. But remember, we also have a lot of less developed country who desperately need economic growth to boost the living condition and others. So um, uh, the economic growth and the climate change uh, uh, are facing by the policymaker. 
But if you look at uh, the relationship, uh, whether we can achieve worm, stone, to bird, uh, very unfortunately, it's probably not that the case. Even we hear a lot of story uh, underneath, people mention that uh, many country, many developed country achieve a decoupling between emission and economic growth. Um, but very unfortunately, we look at the China case is not. And when, when I simply aggregated the, the world total emission and world total GDP, it's not decoupling. It's uh, probably can, without any econometrics, you can straightforward see the relations are very straightforward. Uh, high economic growth, high emission, they're closely correlated. So that is creating a, a challenge for the issue we highlighted in the previous two slides. We have a climate change crisis. We also have a economic ch growth challenge. How we balance these two um, uh, issues we have to face day to day. And well, my working paper, we particularly looking uh, at the primary methods to deal with climate change, that's energy transition. We want to see how the uh, energy transition will impact uh, the sustainable development growth. For those not familiar, this is actually uh, another UN target. We have UN have the Paris Agreement globally agreed. We also have a certain of a development growth by 2030. Uh, for this empirical study, we use the uh, uh, fossil fuel phase out. Uh, use kind of methodology. We we try to reveal the relationship between fossil fuel phase out and the, the 17 sustainable development growth. And very unfortunately, we find that the SDG only four SDG are positive related with with uh, phase out of fossil fuel. And for most others, uh, 40s, uh, more precisely, actually are negative related to fossil fuel phase out. But we all know that phase out of fossil fuel is the key uh, measures we are relying on to deal with the climate change. So that means that um, we have a very difficult uh, decision to, to uh, focus out to the work out the uh, trade off between e uh, economic growth or sustainable development and emission reduction, at least uh, from fossil fuels. We, we definitely have a renewable energy that will generate a new opportunity, but due to data limitation, we couldn't do much empirical study on that. We also have a more detailed study about the 180 second level indicator and uh, probably about 100 countries. It become much more complicated and complex. Even in uh, some parts, we can achieve uh, synergy between emission reduction or fossil fuel phase out and uh, some indicator. The uh, the distribution across country still face a major challenge. I just want to use this this empirical study to highlight that uh, we are facing a major challenge, and also. Remember, SDG to, is something we have to achieve or we aim to achieve by 2030. That's seven years uh, away. And um, as I highlight here, there are probably many things we wouldn't be uh, able to achieve. So I think uh, the question or the research question I'm now looking at is that uh, uh, whether we can achieve SDG or what part of the SDG uh, uh, we can achieve by 2030 and what else will be carried on beyond 2030 and how we formulate our global uh, um, work plan or agenda uh, after 2030. So what do we need to do and uh, given the need for climate change, we put out the current uh, SDG 13, but remember we have more urgent for less developed country like uh, non-poverty, uh, zero hunger, those are actually uh, basic human rights issue. How to coordinate in the framework, um, how much we can achieve, and what else we need to do after 2030. This is a kind of a issue I'm thinking, and I, I hope we'll get a, a discussion. And so the last slide, I want to highlight uh, the initiative, uh, which uh, Fahad just mentioned about the global use uh, voice competition, which is initiated by ISIS. This uh, initiative, Fahad Dayong, and a few others we have been working on in the past four years. We want to create actually the uh, forever dialogue 
platform um, to bring people uh, not just from academic but also from industry NGO and international organization to actually physically work out uh, for possible uh, trade-off solutions uh, along our path to toward the 2030 and and beyond and so any uh, is is free to everyone who are interested and so I, I hopefully we can engage more discussion and uh, debate um, today and in the future and uh, through our conference in Bangkok or use voice competition uh, all these ways to work out those uh, kind of solution not for global but at least locally or at for time beings uh, which face by all us. Um, I'm looking forward to discussion and um, and the discussion and again con uh, congratulations for the uh, success of the book. Uh, but yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Rod, for your presentation and for introducing ISETs. Okay, so uh, next. Uh, presentation before we have the Q&A and the book launch is by the co-editor of this book, Professor Dayong Zhang, who is a professor at the Southwestern University of Finance and Economics of China, and he's the vice president of ISETS. Uh, Professor Dayong is, for example, present on climate, energy, and financial markets. Dayong, please. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Farhat, for organizing this event. Um, I, su I supposed to be here, but uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I didn't make it. Um, so uh, the, uh, the brief talk I'm going to give today is essentially related to the handbook. Um, so uh, I, I, I've written a few chapters in the in the book related to climate, energy, uh, and financial markets. Um, I think to start with is something Rock has mentioned. Uh, so climate change has become more serious uh, across the world. Um, I think in in China we do experience quite a lot of uh, uh, extreme weather events uh, recently in. Uh, in South China, some heavy rains around and also hot temperatures across the uh, country. And indeed, if you look at the back of the data and we've seen these natural disasters has become um, increasing dramatically over the last decades and making climate race or climate change the most challenging issue to the global society. And of course, if you see the numbers and the trillions of US dollars losses and you know, half million uh, people losses during uh, 1999 to 2018. And also if you, if you look at recent global risk reports by the World Economic uh, Forum, um, the top three risks over the next 10 year period are all related to climate change. So there's something that we need to to deal with and we need to deal with, uh, with urgency. You know, one thing we, we do look at uh, the current status and we all know that carbon emissions or the greenhouse gas emissions are the main um, contributor to, um, uh, to the global warming or to the recent climate uh, crisis. Uh, but if you look at the numbers here and we, it's, it's easy to spot that, uh, uh, the, the main reason we have uh, increasing carbon emissions is because of the burning of the fossil fuels. Okay? So they are the main contributors to the global carbon emissions. And of course, if we want to deal with uh, global uh, warming, then transition from fossil fuels to clean energy 
is a critical move. But there are lots of challenges, like Walt mentioned, you know, um, removing fossil fuels will have a lot of consequences that are affecting other parts of the sustainability uh, in the world. And also energy transition is, a, is actually a long-term process. It's not like, you know, we want to replace the fossil fuels with something else uh, like renewables. It's not happening one night. It's just taking ages, years or decades for the renewables to become a reliable substitute to fossil fuels. And obviously we can see from the uh, examples recently like energy crises across the world showing that we cannot, um, you know, um, simply seeing that we don't use fossil fuels and replace it with something uh, renewable. So there's a lot of challenges um, um, for, for, for the whole energy transition process to go. And obviously, uh, another major issue related to one of the keywords in my talk is financial market, is something related to finance. It's like IE estimates that a total annual energy investment uh, for the net zero um, commitments around the world will be like 5 trillion US dollars by the end of the current decades. And this is a huge amount of investment uh, leading to the questions, you know, where the money comes from, how do we distribute this money if there is something available. And obviously we have developed countries which uh, have resources and uh, we have developing countries is, um, you know, like India, China, you know, emissions, but then uh, how uh, we were lacking of the financial resources to, to deal with these issues and how to balance the demand and supply of these resources is a, another major issue. Uh, but while we're looking at the energy transition or on the way towards, um, you know, to, to deal with climate changes, there are a number of, uh, of major issues that we also have to pay attention to. In the recent years, for example, there's a kind of thing called energy financialization. Um, this is something, um, a, 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 well, it's not very new concepts, but uh, it's something new happened in the energy market. Is the energy supposed to be a commodity? and its price supposed to be determined by demand and supply. But some of the evidence showing that in the recent years, um, demand and supply is not able to explain the price movements. So we do say extreme price fluctuations. For example, on the uh, left graph, you can see, see the, the price of the oil is much more volatile than um, the, the consumption and production or the gaps there. And there's also a, a lots of new things happens in the financial markets, like innovation of energy-based products, uh, futures, uh, and other financial products in, in the financial markets, and making uh, the investors to energy markets, not necessarily the user of the energy, but others uh, like financial practitioners, like say, for example, men, uh, money managers, like hedge funds. And they're opening interest, uh, if you look at the right, uh, uh, graph, we can see obviously um, there is an increasing volume of uh, money managers net opening position uh, in, in the US. So all of this kind of changes making the, uh, the transition, energy transition much more uh, complicated. And obviously when we look at financialization, we look at climate, energy, and the financial market, one thing we have to realize is um, the, the current situation for, for climate and um, energy market uh, changes lead to uh, lots of new risk factors. And here is something we, we've, you know, many people are familiar with, like physical risk related to the extreme weather, extreme uh, climate events. And also there is something, um, you know, more interesting in the recent days and people talking about the transition race. It arises from like policy uncertainties, technological changes, and you know like consumer preferences and those sort of things that are um, that is not appear in the previous uh, uh, studies. But when we look at a low carbon transition, we know that this energy transition or low carbon transition itself will cause a lots of troubles. Like for example, uh, billions or trillions of stranded assets to energy companies. And also there are possibilities of this kind of risk when they move into the financial market 
they can lead to uh, financial, uh, you know, financial instabilities because these extra risk factors will affect the financial market. And of course, when you look at the needs for energy transition, the needs for financial markets to provide uh, resources to uh, energy transition, that is, you know, something that we cannot ignore. You know, the financial stability issues, and obviously some of the regulators like Fed or a Basel Committee, and they all put climate risk, especially transition risk, into the uh, you know financial stability assessment frameworks. So making uh, this thing. Um, new um, to, um, to, to the market. Um, but obviously, when we look at all this kind of demand for, for energy transition and all the challenges we have here, and, and inevitably we um, can understand there are lots of things for policymakers to think about it. And obviously there are policy dilemmas, like for example, like Rock was mentioning, you know, if you want to deal with one thing, then that there might be other things like other sustainable goals may be affected in a different way. So uh, in, in one of the chapters in the handbook, so uh, written by me and Rock, we were talking about the possible policy dilemmas in this energy transition process, that including um, misaligned uh, economic incentives and resource misallocations. And also we need to consider the fact that uh, when we trying to make this successful energy transition, we need to restructure the current energy system. And that could potentially causing uh, issues on energy security. And also uh, something I've just mentioned, and there is uh, policy issues on investment and financing, how to balance the demand and supply, and how to um, try to incentivize private um, market participation, there are also something to be considered by the uh, policymakers across the world. And the fourth policy issues is related to technological progress, because I mentioned the uncertainty is about technology, and but there's a kind of global imbalance. And mo most of these kind of energy uh, green innovations are made by the developed countries, whereas the, the uh, developing countries require uh, support, uh, which is something we don't have at the moment. So how to balance the global needs for new technology uh, is another issue. And last but not least, you know, we, we need to consider energy transition and social justice, because when we look at like uh, the sustainable development goals, and uh, we see the uh, removing fossil fuel energies will cause a lot of other unintended consequences in other aspects. And obviously those are issues affected more to the developed nations or low-income nations, and that makes a big issue about the just energy transition, it's something that we've been talking for, for, for a long time. So those are the policy uh, dilemmas we have to face uh, in, in this kind of process towards a low-carbon uh, world. Uh, well, I, I don't want to spend more time, but if you are interested in uh, in the thing I've mentioned, because as I mentioned, all of this uh, material is, is a very brief summary of the chapters in our uh, handbook. Um, so I think for the following my uh, presentation, there will be a, a formal launch of the handbook of energy policy, which covers much more wider issues uh, on the energy policy across the world related to energy transition, etc. And of course, uh, another issue to mention uh, earlier by, by Fahad is that we are looking into a, um, a, a proposed competition called ISS Youth Voice Competition. And that topic is on just the energy transition. You know, how do we look at, how do we uh, encourage people, especially from the youth, to contribute to energy transition? Um, I mean, that, this is something uh, we're looking forward to. If you are interested or if your students are interested, Place to uh, feel free to look at the uh, website of, uh, in assets, and also we are happy to, uh, you know, um, facilitate the whole process. And hopefully, we have a good discussion in the uh, uh, in the inaugural assets conference in October this year at Bangkok. Uh, I think that I will stop here. Uh, thank you, Fahad. Move to you. Thank you very much. Dayong, 
very interesting presentation and thank you for introducing your chapters, some of your chapters. Okay, before we go for the book launch, uh, if there is any question from the participants on these presentations that we have, please ask. Is there any question? You have a question? Yeah. Do you want do you, do you want mic? Okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the uh, process and trends for green bonds uh, as an instrument uh, of investments. So my question is, uh, what the future prospects and trends for the green bonds as an investment instrument? And also, how can the market uh, evolve and adapt to meet the growing uh, demand for sustainable finance? Thank you for your questions. Uh, my yeah, prospect on green board, uh, I think I, yeah, uh, it, it, in terms of a market size, the size of a green board is very small yeah, compared to the ordinary bond. Uh, according to one study, maybe their market share is less than two or three percent. But I, I, I think uh, the market size continues to grow. Because uh, uh, as other uh, presenters explained, uh, the environment is uh, one of the top uh, policy issues we have to tackle with. So, about the concern about uh, greenwashing, uh, that's why I uh, explained the importance of the information disclosures. If companies they uh, provide or disclose more information on environmental impact or the, the, the related information, the investor they do not know that their money is used for environmental projects or other purposes. And they, they do not know. So the, the financial authorities are number one to get why they try to uh, strengthen. The, the uh, regulations for the, the ESG or green bond uh, disclosures, but yeah, but currently we don't have any uh, uh, except for the EU case. EU they uh, have a very strong regulation for uh, green bond issuers. They have to uh, disclose all the information following their regulations, but. Yeah, except for the EU, the other countries, they uh, do not impose uh, information disclosures to uh, on the issuer. That's only uh, that's, that's uh, the voluntary uh, requirements. But uh, the, based on the, my technical uh, sense, is uh, the, the, the more information disclosure can. Uh, all about the uh, asymmetric information of the issue investors and the issuers. And then I think uh, the, the green bond have a much more room for uh, other than the green bond, the, the, the market players, they uh, develop the other uh, financial instruments like the uh, sustainable bond or sustainable limited bond. So that's a harder variance of our green bonds. So I think that uh, the green bonds and other sustainable financial market will you know, go further. That's my Thank you very much, Professor. Any other question? Is there any other question from the students, participants? Okay, so then with this, let's uh, launch the book, handbook. So let me briefly introduce and uh, then Dion. So, so when I, I mean, um, when I uh, started my first job for teaching at KU University in 2015, I became assistant professor at KU University. 
uh, after my graduation. And uh, when the dean of the School of uh, Economics of K University asked me that, what do you want to teach? So I mentioned I want to teach energy economics and policy. So the reason was that, first of all, because this was my field. Secondly, I found that at Japanese university and at many other universities in different parts of the world, so there are enough experts and courses on the engineering aspects of energy and also environment, but not much on the policy aspects of energy and the economics perspective of it. So this was the reason that I started uh, this class. And I'm glad that today some of the students from that uh, course came to Tokai University and joined this uh, seminar and book launch. Um, actually, this was uh, also the reason that Dayong and I, we uh, started uh, to have this handbook. So we found out that in, in the literature and in the published works, so there is a shortage of a comprehensive book, handbook, a reference book on uh, energy policy to be useful for uh, graduate students, for practitioners, for policy makers, for experts and so on in a simple language, not in a, I mean, uh, for example, scientific journals language and without using very, uh, I mean, difficult terms and so on. And we, I mean, started it more than two years ago. First, we organized a, a call for chapters. We received many chapters, many submissions, and among them, we selected the quality submissions and finally, I mean, reviewed, edited many times, and finally it became this, I mean, the handbook of energy policy that you see here just recently published by Springer Nature, and it is in 33 chapters, almost 1000 pages. It is covering everything about energy policy from energy finance, energy poverty, energy security, energy efficiency, fossil fuels, and also electricity markets and so on. We try to make it very complete to be useful for different people. And I'm glad that finally it is available. So Dayong, please. Okay, thank you Farhad. Um, so once again, I would, uh... I really appreciate uh, you for organizing uh, this event. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't be there uh, on site, but I would be happy, uh, you know, to 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 join um, all these things on site. And obviously, when I see all these people um, in in these uh, uh, online sessions, I mean, I can see some names, uh, authors of the book. And uh, so, um, you know, this. You know, I I, I think for, I I've been working on energy area for for quite a quite a time, but this actually is my first attempt to uh, uh, to edit a a major energy policy you know book in English, right? So it's uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of challenges actually happened during the last two years, but obviously with the um, with the support of the editorial teams and the and also the authors, you know, is, you are you are splendid. So, so excellent work uh, from your side to make all these things happen. And uh, we we know that uh, you know the, the 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 reason we start with this kind of handbook of energy policies, we do realize that uh, you know um, my my research mainly concentrated on China, but we do realize that energy chain, you know, energy transition or energy policies is not only relevant for for a single country. There are many kind of you know, chances that countries or, you know, regions that people can collaborate with each other, right? So we want, we have like energy market integration or regional market collaboration, all those sort of things. But unfortunately, when we, when we look at these this issues, we do say a lot of differences in terms of institutional development, in, in terms of um, policies, in terms of many, many um, aspects that create barriers from countries to work, from, you know, to learn from each other, to work with each other. 
And that gives us the reason um, to start this project. And obviously, uh, I think, you know, after all these efforts, it, it comes up with these 33 chapters, quite big um, chunk of, uh, of, you know, work. And I think it's something that to be, uh, you know, I, I think I'm pretty proud for, for, for all of these uh, uh, authors, contributors, and, uh, you know, the book editors and for, for, for the helps. And I think, you know, this is, is, is a good start point, and I hope that uh, our work can introduce or can bring uh, additional value to the society. But obviously, we have to realize there are also many, many challenges ahead. It's like something that I've mentioned, like policy dilemma, dilemmas, you know, uh, existing in this current world. And there's a lot of things for us, you know, for people who are interested, who are working in these areas, and no, no matter whether you're in academia or students or, you know, policy uh, makers. And I think communication, you know, you know, because we're living in one world. So if we want to have this kind of sustainability to have this, uh, uh, to make this world better, so we need to work together. I think that this handbook is just the starting point. I think from this uh, ahead, then we hope to see a lot more collaborations. And obviously I hope you know, after the pandemics, we could be able to say together actually and work on this project and have more detailed discussions. But anyway, I, I, you know, I conclude this by saying thank you very much for Fahad. You know, work with you it's a great pleasure, and thank you very much for all these contributors and also the editors from from Springer. And your works are um, great. Truly, um, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Far. Thank you very much, Dayong. Uh, yes, it was also a great pleasure for me to work with you. And I also appreciate to all the contributors to this handbook that without their contribution, we could not make this. And to the publisher, Springer Nature for publishing this. Okay. Thank you everyone for your uh, attention and for participation at this seminar and book launch. So with this, we came to the end of the station.